Hello, uh, we welcome you under this uh, channel Lex Consilium Foundation for the playlist Nurturing the Smart Teachers. Uh, today, the course being covered is Law and Economics. Uh, for this presentation, uh, we would have the main presentation is prepared under the guidance of Professor Satish Jain, an uh, eminent economist, academic, and uh, ably supported by Dr. Malabika Paul. So, my first question, I welcome you here, Malabika ji. Thank you. And uh, my first question is exactly what is meant by law and economics? Uh, I will be presenting on behalf of uh, Professor Satish Jain. So, uh, essentially he has prepared the text uh, for us. I will be supplementing with some references over here. Uh, to answer your question, sir, uh, in the sub-discipline of law and economics, laws are analyzed using the economic method from the perspective of economic efficiency. Now, what is the economic method? The economic method consists of systematically working out the actions which would be undertaken by purposive individuals given the rules of the game and the outcomes which are arrived at in consequence of these actions. Now in the economic analysis of law, the outcomes which materialize through the interaction of rational individuals are analyzed from the perspective of economic efficiency. Now, there are thus two distinguishing features of economic analysis of law. What are they? Number one, it uses the economic method to analyze law and two, the analysis is done from the perspective of economic efficiency. A large part of law, particularly common law, has been analyzed by economists from the efficiency perspective. Now, uh, a little bit about the economic efficiency of law, uh, I mean we could, we could go further into it from certain books which I would refer to uh, in, in, in later discussion. Uh, this is something uh, very significant that you just brought out and uh, the law and economics when we talk about its uh, utility or efficiency uh, would be governed say by its application, its operationalization, its utility. But uh, I would like uh, you to please explain what exactly or what actually is meant by economic efficiency. Exactly. So now as we mentioned here, uh, at the core of the economic analysis of law is the concept of economic efficiency. There are several different notions of economic efficiency which are an, uh, employed in economics. In law and economics literature, however, the term is mostly employed in the sense of wealth maximization. A rule or law is called efficient if the outcomes that result under it are invariably wealth maximizing and called inefficient if it lacks this property. Um, moving further, can you give some example to illustrate how laws are analyzed from this efficiency perspective uh, aspect? Absolutely. In fact, uh, we are going to uh, give a very simple example. I will go through it uh, slowly in order to bring out the essence of the uh, economic efficiency concept. And now suppose some activity by individual A gives him a benefit of rupees 1 lakh. So and any kind of activity by individual A gives him a benefit of rupees 1 lakh but causes harm of rupees 10,000 to individual B. Okay, so there is this activity which gives benefit of 1 lakh to A but causes harm to B of 10,000 <coughs> rupees. Now the quantum of harm however can be reduced if individuals A and B 
undertake some precautionary measures. Now, these precautionary measures are often called care. Now, these measures of course, would not be costless, it would cost something, right. Now, let us assume that the cost of precautionary measures of both A and B is rupees 1000 each, okay. So, let us suppose that if only one individual, let us say individual A or individual B undertakes this precautionary measures, then the harm to individual B will be reduced by 5000. And if both individuals A and B take precautionary measures, then harm to individual B will be completely eliminated. So, if either one of them take precautionary measures, then harm will be reduced by 5000. And if both take in precautionary measures, then harm will be completely eliminated. Now, we see here that there is a net social gain which will be at a maximum of rupees 98,000 when both individuals A and B take precautionary measures for abating harm. Why 98,000? Because it is 1 lakh minus the 1000 that each had to undertake in order to eliminate the harm. So, there will be no harm, but each individual A and B will have to incur a cost of 1000 and that is why that, that is 2000. So, 1 lakh minus 2000 is 98000. So, it would be indeed be desirable if both the individuals could be induced to take precaution. So, this is the essence of uh, the story that we want both the individuals to be induced to take precaution on their own. Now, whether they would do so depends on what the law is regarding liability for harm. Let us consider two different laws. First, suppose the law is that whoever, whosoever causes harm to others is fully liable for the harm caused. The law which holds injurers fully liable for harm is known as the law of strict liability. Let us analyze what kind of incentives the law of strict liability would provide in the context of our simple example. Now, individual A by spending rupees 1000 on care can reduce his liability to individual B by 5000 because the harm falls by 5000. Thus, A will take care regardless of whether B takes care or not. On the other hand, as individual B will be fully compensated for the harm, but will have to spend his own money that is rupees 1000 for taking care, he has no incentive to take care. Thus, under strict liability, only the injurer will take care and the net social gain will be 94,000. How did we arrive at 94,000? Rupees 1 lakh gain to individual A minus harm of rupees 5000 to individual B minus cost of care of rupees 1000 to individual A. So, the uh, net social gain will be 94,000. Now, next we consider the law under which the injurer is liable for the harm if and only if he is negligent. In the context of our example, the injurer will be regarded as negligent if and only if he does not take care. Under this rule, if the injurer does not take care, then he will be liable to individual B for rupees 10,000. That is the full amount of the harm. If individual B does not take care or rupees 5,000 if individual B takes care. If the individual, if the injurer takes care, which costs him only 1,000, then he escapes liability altogether. Why is that? Because we are, we said in the beginning that we are considering the law under which the injurer is liable for the harm if and only if he is negligent, that is he is not taking care. Therefore, the injurer will take care regardless of whether the victim takes care or not. Now, the victim realizing that the injurer will take care faces the choice between taking no care or suffering and suffering harm of rupees 5000 and taking care and spending rupees 1000 and suffering no harm. A rational victim clearly will take care. Now, in this con thus in the context of our example, the law that makes the injurer liable if and only if he is negligent is able to induce both the parties to take care and thereby maximize the net social gain. Thus, 
In our example, the outcome yielded by strict liability rule is inefficient and the outcome yielded by the rule that the injurer is able to is injurer is liable if and only if he is negligent is efficient. Uh, thanks Malvika. Uh, this brings us uh, to the end of the first video and uh, in the next edition we would talk about the main findings of uh, law and economics which you may like to enumerate. Thank you. Thank you.